Okay, so this is the public space uh, workshop. My name is Ana Mendez Andes, and I'm going to moderate this session. I will present our wonderful uh, guests as well. And um, I'm going to also give brief introduction of uh, why we thought of all the different things that public space is a key issue. And also, and especially in relation with municipalist uh, processes. I'm an architect and urban planner. I've been teaching uh, design of public space for many years, also designing it. And um, that explains my interest. But I do think it's quite remarkable the way how a lot of the movements that actually brought us here, a lot of the struggles and processes that have been, uh, I think, the key events in the last few years actually relate to the public space and to the fence of the public space and to the presence in the public space and what that means. First, because as we know, public space is, has, you know, many, contains very different aspects. One, which is like, one could say the most obvious, it's that the public space is also political space. Being in the public is being in a political place where you're seen and where your voice is heard. Actually, in Italian, to go in a demonstration, uh, you say, essere in piazza. And it doesn't matter if the demonstration goes through narrow streets, you are still in piazza. Um, and this links, of course, with the issue of the Agora. We are not talking about the restrictions of the Greek democracy here, but it's also interesting to know. Uh, secondly, it's also a way of communication. We had next to us uh, at CEN, there was a workshop about mobility, and mobility is been a very important issue in the local governments, at least in Spain. In our experience, mobility and the relation with pollution is really something where we are breaking ground. Um, but also, in general terms, public space is a resource. It's where you meet the other, it's where you can sell things, it's where you socialize. And in the, in the general uh, imaginary, public space is the most common space. It's, if we think of any kind of public property that we can think as common, is the space. It's the public space. But the public space is heavily regulated by the city council. It belongs to the public, it belongs to the city council, and whatever you can and you cannot do is actually uh, defined by the city council. If you can sell something in the street or not. If you can sit in a bench and drink a beer that you bought from the shop in the corner, is defined. If you can skate or not, is defined by the city council. The use of the space is defined by the city council, or the law, bylaws of the city council. At the same time, public space is so vast that it's very difficult to actually enforce that control. So it turns into an arbitrary measure that you apply wherever actually it suits you. And where is it? It's usually in the places where there is more potential uh, production of capital. So the city centers usually are heavily monitorized. That means that they are heavily controlled by usually bylaws that apply to the whole city, but just you cannot put a police in every corner, everywhere in the city. And that means that a lot of the public space is self-managed. And it goes with regulations and rules that actually emanate from the society and not from the city council because it's just not possible to regulate it. As I said at the beginning, if we see, you know, of all this process from um, the Arab Spring, taking out uh, place in, in the squares, to Gezi Park in, uh, in Istanbul that was against the 
you know, the uh, reforms in Berlin and actually the disappearing of a public space to also the, for example, uh, experience in Zagreb where people mobilized against, again, the privatization of a public space to um, uh, this experience, uh, the, the, I don't remember the name, in a little neighborhood in Burgos, a likely place in Spain, Ramonal, where there were riots and uh, you know, uh, vehicles uh, on fire uh, in this totally unlikely place because they wanted again to privatize somehow the public space. So I think that this is in itself um, a very strong indication of what is the role and also how, and, and this we have also seen in Spain, that the, when at the end of the financial housing bubble and there was no more extraction of plus value on the new housing market, then the privatization went into public services and the public space. So the proliferation of terraces in the streets, the proliferation also of commercial uses, and the restriction, I think Barcelona again, but also Madrid, are examples of, uh, they were called ordenanzas civicas, no? the sense of how the civic bylaws, how you should be in the public space, is one of our strongest, uh, I would say, common assets. And uh, again, in all the work about urban commons, very often it is the public space one of the issues and one of the, of the main assets that are articulated as this collective space. On technical terms in Spain, actually, um, public space will be very close to the commons because it's dominio publico, and dominio publico have this characteristic of inalienability and uh, uh, you know, this belonging to everybody. But as I said, we have to be aware of what is the frames that actually define the access to this resource. Uh, we are going to, to start with Eva and Shania. I don't know which order. Okay. Uh, Eva uh, Marcevic, I think, no? Marcevic is. Uh, from Zagreb, uh, part of uh, a platform that went to elections uh, two months ago, one month ago? Uh, one month, uh, less than a month ago. Three, four weeks ago, they got four seats in the, in the local council. And um, uh, yeah, I have asked all the speakers to actually make an introduction of short introduction about their experience, and then we will go with a round of questions, and then we will open up the discussion, and Raquel is not in a very good shape with her voice. Uh, and I think that, uh, yeah, the fact that she was like giving a talk on the CCCB, uh, giving 15 interviews, and then going to the assembly in the PA, <laughs> summarizes a lot what she's doing, but now she's not in the, her best shape, so she will, make some remarks uh, at the end. Okay. Um, Anna, perhaps you can change the slides or? What? So you, yeah, sure. I can do it. Uh, <coughs> yeah. Okay, now it's uh, perhaps uh, perhaps it's too dark. Stand up. Mm -hmm. Oh, guys, I'm too, I'm too tall for that. I'm sorry. I can't see. I can't I can't see my my laptop if I if I look at you. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I think you, you can see me you. and ah, you need. Uh, ah, okay. I think this would be good, yeah. 
project afterwards. Okay, so uh, hopefully you can hear me. Sometimes I, I um, tend, tend to, to talk um, not very loud, so warn me. Uh, so as Anna said, I come from Zagreb, uh, and we have, uh, we have had the election uh, some weeks ago, I'm still still having this uh, post-traumatic stress kind of <laughs> disorder, so forgive me. Um, uh, but uh, as Anna asked, uh, she wanted me to kind of present what public space meant for us in a sense how it produced conflict uh, in Zagreb. How it produced something that we are uh, talking about, the mobilization that we are talking about now and the politics that we are into now. So she asked me to start with something that happened, started happening uh, 11 years ago, uh, a fight uh, over um, a street in Zagreb, a public street in the center of the Zagreb, uh, where um, um, mobilization never uh, seen before um, happened uh, around an issue of urban transformation. Uh, but I will uh, uh, start with this and try to uh, give a short, in, a short overview of what happened afterwards leading to where we are now. So this, as you see, is the big protest that we had. Um, this, this exactly is, I think, seven years ago. Uh, and uh, the issue uh, that we were dealing with uh, was... Uh, uh, can you change the was the change uh, in the center of the city. Uh, this little blue dot uh, is where this thing was happening. Uh, what was happening to us in the 2000s, uh, I come from Croatia, I don't know if you guys knew, knew no, we, we went through a process of, um, uh, how do you say, um, reintroducing of capitalism. So in the 2000s, uh, urban, trans urban transformations were something that were slowly happening, that were uh, evolving in front of our eyes, and it took us some time to, under some time to understand them. This here is the center of the city, and uh, by the master plan, it was uh, changed at the beginning, master plan changed in the beginning of the 2000s uh, in order to extract uh, more value from the, from the center, uh, central blocks to commercialize them and to commercialize the space in the center of the city. Basically, if I can uh, kind of explain it, uh, we had a city um, that looks, looked um, um, authentic as the city can be, and through the years, through the last 10 or 12 years, Zagreb city center looks like any kind of uh, city center in Europe. Uh, this was the change that happened in front of our eyes. And at the be beginning of this change, we had this huge, uh, this huge protest. We called it uh, a protest against a second wave of privatization robbery. First wave was deindustrialization and consequent deindustrialization, and then uh, the appropriation of public space. Um, okay, uh, so if you can change the... So this is the development that I, I was talking about, they, um, one of the developments. Uh, there were different blocks inside of the city that were deemed for such a development, but this one was especially arrogant because it took the public street as its own. And th this figure of the mayor, the guy on the left, uh, was something that, uh, uh, that became um, he became this, uh, uh, through the years, this master of Zagreb. They just showed his, uh, his face at the beginning of the 2000s and actually ran on the platform of social justice and then became this, uh, this ruler of Zagreb that concentrated the power inside of the institution of the mayor. So that's how the institutionally the city changed. This guy is still a mayor. Uh, it's been now 17 years. And this is the investor. So this connection uh, between them uh, started to be very, <laughs> Uh, very visual and they were not ashamed of it and there was at one point um, um, they, they actually advertised uh, this uh, new um, new spaces new public spaces that they are going to create in, in the city of Zagreb these new public spaces are finally going to be something clean and they're not going to be old socialist red holes we are going to get this, uh, this wonderful commercialized space where we can uh, where we can be real Europeans, uh, uh, real Europeans. So um, 
to oppose that in the beginning of the 2000s was a very big thing, to really open it up and say and call it what it, what it really was, as it was a robbery, as it was not creating public space, but commercializing our space that we, that we are using. So I'm just going to go uh, briefly. Yeah, so to over the years, <laughs> we created this um, a huge support around this around this issue. This, these are the actions that we have. I'm just going to collect 54,000 signatures at one point uh, opposing this project and creating uh, a mass. Yes, thank you, Anna. Uh, mass demonstrations. As I said, at one point we had a demonstration of 10,000 people uh, on the streets, uh, which was very, uh, and it was very, um, and it was covered uh, very well in the media because for the first time somebody made uh, somebody uh, uh, made actions that that attracted media towards the. Uh, towards this this issue, with things like uh, placing a Trojan horse uh, to the thank you Anna, uh, <laughs> to the to uh, blocking the actual development. Uh, later on, of course, uh, uh, people got arrested, and uh, the power of the power of the mayor and the, uh, really uh, was was evident at that point. His uh, but what we also uh, created uh, was this issue that uh, public space and also produced knowledge about what the public space should be and how it should not and what it means that our cities are getting intensely in, intense um, that they are ga getting cleaned up and uh, and commercialized. This is the protest that we did uh, when the when this whole thing opened. Of course, we did not win. That is. Um, <laughs> But we, um, uh, when, when the whole thing opened, we organized a huge protest where they uh, arrested people for wanting to get into this public space, which was a very, I think, uh, nice action uh, because it showed that this 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 thing is not going to be uh, is not going to be public. Uh, we did, uh, in the end, uh, this this uh, big actions that say total fraud or uh, throwing um, public interest into the abyss. Um, so uh, just okay. So just to uh, okay. So this is the this uh, the center of, of Zagreb, as I said, and there are different points in Zagreb where the development of the city uh, caused losing of jobs, commercializing, and things like that. But only two points of them were as uh, popular as I was saying. And this other one is very interesting because it kind of uh, is the space of the of one factory that became uh, a part of um, this huge uh, project of, I don't know, beautifying the city and making, planning the city without the factories, without the workers and, and things like that. So uh, what we did connected with the workers and, uh, and created uh, knowledge again in the media also and uh, broadening these issues that changing the urban plans meant at the same time losing jobs and that the mayor and, its, and his master plan uh, were actually uh, quite um, uh, uh, quietly destroying uh, many lives. Uh, later on, you can I just we we connected with different initiatives uh, throughout Croatia. This this is uh, the map of Croatia. It's very silly. So these are the three. Uh, Zagreb is in the north. Um, so we, um, Anna, if you can just, uh, we um, connected with Dubrovnik, which opposed, uh, which opposed the uh, golf resort. With uh, they organized a referendum, connected with another coastal city, which also uh, contested uh, public property and public resources becoming uh, be being privatized and sold off for elite uh, development. Uh, so in the end, at one point, we had uh, a country that looked like this. Uh, this is, I love this map. This is a map, a new map of Croatia, actually a map of resistance in Croatia, where different workers um, um, struggles, public, uh, uh, public space struggles uh, connected throughout the cities and cities together with other cities. Uh, there was a, a period in Croatia where this was very, very alive. 
Uh, but of course, whatever we did, I'm going to finish. Uh, our um, institutions did not change. Our mayor uh, continued to build ever crazier projects, fountains, uh, while the city is, is crumbling, uh, city infrastructure is crumbling, also uh, uh, crazy, uh, crazy parks, basically um, destroying uh, all sense of public space being a free space where anybody can decide on what they would anybody well, where their decision is, uh, is is ever possible we were part of many blockades many uh, protests uh, and things um, uh, connected to that which uh, did not uh, bring us further uh, uh, far in institutional change or in bettering our city so we decided to get into this um, to collect this energy that we had that, that was created and go into the uh, into the elections. Uh, I will not go into detail here about that. You just say that we want four seats uh, in the city parliament, 21 seats in I don't know how do you translate it, but quartier councils. Uh, Zagreb has um, 17 quartier councils and 47 seats in 41 neighborhood council. So here we are now, and uh, yeah, that's, that's thank you. So the idea that, of course, is not only the region, but I think that some of also the strategies and the conflicts around uh, the great Dutton drum, I'm not able to say it in Serbian, uh, resonate also with, with Zagreb. So now we have to go with the Uh, yeah, I need to clarify in the beginning that we are not part of the local government, but we Close to hmm? Close to okay, we are not part of the local government yet, but we are going to try to become part, and I will try to explain why we got to that point. Uh, so I will tell you about Belgrade Waterfront project. Um, that at first we thought that it's another case of uh, ur like urban speculation, but then it, it started in 2014, and in these less than three years, we realized that it's a really nice uh, example of how the whole state can collapse when uh, uh, put like against the private interest of uh, some shady investors, whoever. So it's important. So, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so it's important to 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 know that. Um, uh, yeah. Our uh, yeah the context. So we had this uh, state that was somehow centralized and it had some idea of its modernization and development and then they then came the civil war in, during the 90s and 2000s with a mass protest that uh, were okay I will stop and then uh, the, the, uh, that put thousands of the people on the street in effort to put Milosevic that I guess you know about down uh, that led people to feel disappointed about any action in public space because it was a huge energy involved in that, but then it uh, came into nothing because everything, because we had then democratic uh, powers in charge, but then they, they were the ones who privatized everything and sold out everything and closed the factories and everything. So they actually facilitate these bad guys from the 90s to take power again, and we are in that state right now. Um, so, and the second part that is really disappointing in this is that this uh, mantra of privatization and foreign investment that are, we all have to uh, take in uh, is also promoted by European Union. So it's kind of tricky now to go to, towards them 
when you know that it's bad for the society itself. Uh, so, oh, no, we can start. So this is the area where the Belgrade Waterfront project is supposed to be developed. It's the central area in Belgrade. It's not a public space in a sense. People don't use it because it's covered in railway tracks. It's the place where the main railway station and bus stations are. It's 100 acres. And it's really valuable in all urban plans. It was uh, saved for the new city center, for opera house, uh, house that we don't have. Uh, for large parks next to a riverbank, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, it was used before in election campaigns. It first uh, was used in 2012, but the guy that, was not, that is now our president, he lost that elections. In 2014, they reinstalled it. This is the night before the elections. Uh, this was printed in the newspapers that you get for free on the bus stations. Okay, I don't feel like this. Uh, you can stop this. Yeah, I don't know, because you, you can... Pause. Uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> so, you open up the newspapers and you see that your most valuable land is going to be developed in such a way that you will have a highest tower in the Balkans, the biggest shopping mall in the Balkans next to a river, and these two million square meters of, uh, I don't know, offices and luxury apartments. Uh, in a moment where this is like a building in the center of Belgrade that is totally vacant, like people don't have jobs, don't have money, they don't have money to buy a normal apartment, never, like not, and not the luxury ones, and nobody asks you about that. So they were commercializing this new identity of Belgrade and you were not asked. For us, I'm an architect, it was impossible. So we still were looking at this as like some PR campaign because those were the elections. So we thought, okay, they are doing it again. But, but then what happened is that they started changing all the regulations in order to implement this project. And uh, so that was shocking. Yeah, this is, uh, these are the phases. Yeah, and the president, he, prime minister at that point, he presented this project with investor from United Arab Emirates. The guy came uh, and gave us this master plan of new identity of Belgrade. So everything was settled. So they will build all this. They declared this project as a project of national importance that legally doesn't mean anything, but it sounds good in the newspapers because now you, are, you have a national importance. So, and our prime minister said that the project is on a fast lane, like the, those like kind of quote. So they just started changing everything. It was presented in uh, this way. This is the investor from the Emirates, the future <coughs> Belgrade. Yeah, then, so they changed the general urban plan of Belgrade uh, in such a way that they just erased every notion of this part of Belgrade, just erased. Then they invented this new uh, spatial plan for areas of special importance uh, that they actually just copied the model we, we saw the, before. They mm, forced our official institutions to copy this into an official spatial plan. Old Belgrade, that was not enough. Then they, they installed this special law of ex for expropriation where this is the first time that just for this project, the uh, state is uh, allowed to expropriate the private property for the commercial project. So that never happened before. And it, it's a special law, so it only goes for the Belgrade waterfront project. Uh, yeah. They signed the contract. And uh, five months after the signing of the contract, they, uh, they, they made it public because of the pressure and because they were pr previously promoting it as 3.4 billion euros. So in every newspaper, you would see this number, like 3.4 billion of euros of investment, although it doesn't mean anything because they were calculating every square meters of these two million square meters. If you sell them, then maybe altogether it will have this worth. But then in the uh, contract that they showed, it said that they only have to invest 20 million of uh, euros. Other than that, those are just the loans. 
Uh, we have to invest all the necessary infrastructure, clean the area, pay the expropriation, and we are actually giving them the land. So the 100 acres of the land, although our mayor and our prime minister, they always would say that it is just a lease, actually uh, for every building they build, they, they, can, they, they become owners of this land. So the, okay, so, oh, no. Yeah. So it, maybe then I will switch it like what we did in the second part. Yeah. So like it's an estimation that we have to invest two billion Euro of euros. And the first evalu evaluation period is, it's not 25, it's in 20 years. When we sit down and discuss what happened with this uh, present we gave them is in 20 years. Uh, part of the, the contract was also saying that for each uh, of like part of the land that they reconstruct, they can actually manage it. So although it, it stays in the public ownership, they actually can manage and uh, give a lease for, to private uh, companies and then extract money, fr money from it. And also this is a moment where we uh, were filming an interview about the project on the recon reconstructed uh, riverbank and they sent police to, to, to remove us from that because so they privatized the riverbank itself. It was all followed with this uh, really strong commercial campaign, everything illegal, like all these flag posts, all the commercials were done totally illegally. Uh, this is the huge, uh, if you would come by train, you, this would be the first thing you see, the huge billboard with the sign, let's celebrate Belgrade, that was also being uh, watched by police. Yeah, the another illegal reconstruction of the protected cultural her heritage. And yeah, this is the moment, like, it, um, it started, in, okay, I have 30 seconds. It started in 2014 and this happened in April 2016. Uh, during the night, uh, 30 masked men closed this area. Uh, they were wearing, uh, well, it's, it's yeah. Balaka, yeah. and baseball bats. Uh, they took people away from the buildings that were old warehouses, tied them down, and demolished the whole street. Uh, and after that, nothing happened. Like, the media did not cover the story. Our mayor said everything is okay, nothing happened. We still don't know what happened. And uh, people actually, uh, after that, the ombudsman uh, made a report and it was discovered that they, people actually called the police and the police did not come. Uh, and so for, it was a huge scandal, but for us this was not that unexpected because we were covering the whole process of implementing of this project and we, we, we already knew that they are not afraid of anything and they can go against every law and every, every like notion of the state in order to develop this project. And then in the second part, I can tell about how we uh, released it. Thanks. So Fran Francesca. works also of uh, Conseller de District, so local councillor for, which district was it? Yeah, this in the Eixample district. In the Eixample, and, uh, and uh, um, this is featured in the program, we, would, we wanted to have this opportunity of talking about public space also to talk about the implementation of the Superilla, so there's big islands uh, in uh, uh, the creation of public space between the crossing of the, of the blocks. So basically the Superillas take four blocks, make a super block, and then introduce pedestrians uh, pedestrian uh, streets. Uh, streets and circulation or restricted circulation as well. Um. So I think that what was interesting also of the Berwait and Zagreb explanations that how is interaction 
beyond this local level into the national politics, but also transnational investment, also transnational investment, and now we go back to uh, how to shape well, I'm the public space. Okay. Um, uh, in the last uh, round table, the pollution, I don't know if we have in there, and all the, all the people talk about of um, super blocks. Super blocks is on fashion. But we have a little problem here because it's not exactly <laughs> all that we say in, 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 um, in other countries that it happened here. Uh, this is a, a little problem. Uh, and I, will, I would like to talk about this. I would like to talk about <coughs> urban project uh, tradition in Barcelona because Barcelona is now very, very, very known around the world with the Olympic Games about uh, public projects uh, with the public space. Uh, but now I think we are in crisis and the approach is a little bit different. I, I am going to talk about this. One of these, uh, I'm sorry because there is, uh, one of the things is that more, uh, each, each year, uh, there are more than 3,500 people in the metropolitan area who died prematurely. And these, these deaths are more than uh, cancer, heart, and, and drive, and car. Uh, there is an institution here, it's ES Global. Uh, this institution has made uh, statistics and he, show, he has showed that in the metropolitan area we are going to live more or less one year less. The impact more striking is the reduction of life expectancy. This is a, a, a big problem this, for us. This is not exactly, for example, the cities in, uh, in Germany or in, uh, in, in Holland or in other countries, but especially in the Mediterranean cities with a lot of traffic and a lot of density, uh, we have a real problem. We are compact, we are diverse, we are, uh, um, we are very good, but we have a real problem because our expectancy is, is very bad because we are going to live. I, I am going to live one year less because I live at the in Sanchi in Barcelona. This is a real problem. This is a, a cut of uh, a contamination pollution uh, of the pollution, and you can see that the traffic is concentrated at the center of the city because we have a. Uh, a plot that is very indicated for, for, for the private car. Uh, and the concentration of pollution is in my district, in the district of Ensanche. Uh, this is one of the big problems that we have. Uh, and more or less, this is the... But um, for this, we have a real problem. And we have discovered five years ago with these statistics. And after this, now we are talking about pollution and the, the relationship with uh, the deaths for the people who live there. One thing that we have seen is uh, that the concentration of pollution is at, at the main streets with more traffic. Uh, this is one of the evidences. But because you have uh, metropolitan contamination, urban contamination, and the streets where you, you are more traffic, you are more contamination. And we have seen with the measures that, for example, uh, Aragon, eh, do you know Aragon? Uh, if you have visited our city, Aragon uh, has more than 140 micrograms uh, for uh, meter cube, a eh, cube meter. But in a pedestrian street, as uh, Borrell, you have less than 40. For this street, the, 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 the conditions are more or less good, huh? but on the other streets is not it's terrible. Huh? And in the last uh, round table, the people ask, and the industrial, but there is industrial here also. But the problem is 70% of pollution is associated to the private car. Huh? 
and we are more concentration in the main, the main streets with more, more traffic. Eh? 40 and 140. And we are promote a very good plan, uh, is, a, is a plan of superblocks. But his plan, he, it was approved in, uh, in uh, 213. The plan is from 213 until 218, but we have made only one superblock. And the, 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 the conditions that they have considered is not correct because they propose all these superblocks, but we have only one superblock. Huh? And is, there is a lot of discussions about, super, about said superblock. The, the idea is very simple and it's very good. Uh, you talk about uh, car model, it's all, uh, the car is all the streets, in all the streets of the past, and now with the superblock, we have at the periphery, you have cars and public transport, and the, the streets inside, you have only uh, pedestrians and cycle. This it was approved uh, five years ago, a project uh, of five superblocks with this idea. But for me, superglob is a Magoofy. What is a Magoofy? You know Magoofy, Hitchcock, yeah? Well, the first moments of the film, Ah, you, 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 ah, is this, the, 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 the murder is, is he, uh, it's, uh, it's clear. But in fiction, Magoofy is a plot device in the form of some goal, desired object, or other motivator that the protagonist pursues, often with a little or no narrative explanation. The specific nature of Magoofy is typically unimportant to the overall plot. Usually, the Magoofy is the central focus of the film at the first act and thereafter declines in importance. It may reappear at the climax of the story, but sometimes is actually forgotten by the end of the history, uh, the, the story. The future that distinguishes other kinds of excuses plot is its interchangeability. From the point of view of the, audi the, of the audience, the McGuffin is not the important element of the story told. McGuffin is to capture the viewer attention quickly, give way then the real plot. What, why I say this? Super plot is a very good, a super blocks is a very good idea. All the people talk about super block. We are interesting to change our plots. Which, eh? why, uh, but what happened? We have introduced the super blocks in the ancient plots of the city, in Gracia, in San Andreu, but not at the, at the in Sanche. And we have a lot of discussions with one of these. And of, one of the ideas is the idea that you enter and after you are, uh, get out rapidly. Huh? Two minutes. Uh, and for this we have created another idea. We are on super blocks idea, but we prefer to talk about of a grid of uh, green streets because this it will be possible to do in the next years and the most important thing that this now is uh, according with the organizations of the neighborhoods the neighborhoods approve this this model we are organized not an institutional plot of super block but an uh, super block bottom up organized by the institutions with a network of green streets. And we have proposed a, a, a strategy to, to introduce this uh, strategy of superblocks, and the idea is to introduce one superblock in one neighborhood. Each neighborhood we're going to win uh, a superblock, but with this new structure. Superblock is a McGuffin, and, uh, and uh, the end of the film is another thing. I don't know what it will be the, the end of the film, but because the, the end of the film, it will be in 20 years after. But now, this is the, the film. The film is here now. Huh? In our, we have proposed these uh, streets, and 
we have considered that it is not possible to, uh, to, to win two streets each time, but it's possible to win one of them. Huh? This is the idea. And the idea is that now this now is a proof for, for the for the, the major now. Huh? This is our project of super blocks in the city. But the idea, the magoofing that it's related around the wall is super blocks. For me, super blocks at this moment is this. I don't know in 10 years, but now it's here. And we are going to propose the next super blocks. It will be in San Antonio, and it will be this. Huh? But we have developed the, the, the idea of Superblock. Huh? This is the, the, the Superblock. The film of Superblock now is here. I don't know in the next chapter. Eh? The, ne the next chapter it will be. But now it's, it's this. And I think it's, it, it will be this. But for me, and with, with, with this I, 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 uh, I am going to, to talk, this is important. We are going to win streets for, for the people, for the pedestrians, without pollution. This is the most important because pollution is a very big problem at the center of the city in Ensanche. But beside this, we have other big problems. In San Antonio, we have to develop an instrument to promote urban public housing in the neighborhood of San Antonio. Each time we introduce a superblock, we, we are going to, to develop instruments for public uh, housing uh, because to develop uh, public housing rights we are going to do together with neighborhood organizations uh, and we have to introduce uh, strategies, collective inform and educate the local to open discussion on the right of tenants, promote the addition of owners in the, if you have an empty apartment you have the key, uh, open an antenna advisory service and support of the office in housing, create a mediation service, inform the public of the supply of public housing and the status of new developments, and promote the change of rental housing, aid to the rehabilitation, advise on mortgage debt, detect cases and coordinate so social service that have affected housing, advise on aid for the drafting of the report of the technical building inspection. If we talk about of the right of the city, at this moment, the right of the city is to win the streets, and we're going to win the, the, the streets with a, with a network of green streets that we take, we talk uh, super blocks because it's on fashion, and we're going to continue to talk the, the super blocks, but with another idea, and also the most important, is a very public policy about housing. Uh, this is a very important thing and in, we, we can develop other aspects, but for me it's important that public space in Barcelona now is to protect the housing for the people who, who, who have the right to access uh, to the housing now. Thanks. Laura is an urban researcher <laughs> in Berlin, and, uh, and yeah, we are uh, going to have, uh, we are going to see that miseries don't only happen in the south and periphery uh, countries, but also at the core center of the Western civilization. <laughs> so thank you for inviting um, me to this. Um, um, simulating event, I, um, I was as I was asked to talk in a municipalization um, event. I thought I have to talk to kind of the institutional practices, how to try to institutionalize and um, practices which can come from the bottom, and and how it is occurring in Berlin. And I think there are some practices which are. And interesting also for the expectations of the audience and for Barcelona. And it is 
kind of funny event for me because I'm, I'm originally from Barcelona, so as um, Frances said many years, and everyone was looking to Barcelona for the public space, and I was often asked to talk in Berlin about Barcelona, so now I talk to, about Barcelona. to Barcelona, and <laughs> so many people around the world about Berlin is kind of changing um, the world. I will not talk about this, but, but this is for me maybe the most typical and idiosyncratic kind of public space in Berlin. It was not public in this um, way you talk about the public um, ownership of a space. It was like empty plots, which are private in the, uh, usually, but there was not kind of investment. And because of this, they were public because people could use them in the most ways. But I wanted to talk what was the new um, thinking about public space, the discovery of public space after the 90s. And there are a lot of similitudes about you talk about uh, Belgrade and Zagreb, this kind of commercialization of space and so on. But I wanted to link it, it to a much broader discourse of urban design, which was not just commercialization. It was kind of the myth of the European city. And the European city was kind of miscreated from German conservative white middle class men. And, and they just don't just rediscover the public space and try to um, create nice squares and so on. Maybe this is, this is very representative. Né? This is Brandenburg, I don't know how you say it in English. But, also, many places have been redesigned um, like that. But it's not just the square, it's also all the buildings surrounding it have been rebuilt as in the traditional way. The time of the wall, it was not buildings around the Brandenburg Tour. Yeah? So it was a kind of very, very traditional, conservative and colonial masculine way to create a um, public space. But in the time well, where Barcelona and many places in the world had a very strong speculation um, moment, in, so very high um, investment um, pressure, Berlin is, was nothing about this. Nobody wanted to invest in Berlin between uh, 97 and 2007. So um, architects it didn't know what to do. Many went to Moscow or other places. And other people, architects, artists, neighbors, everything, were creative and they were using these spaces in other ways. Um, and they were kind of substituting investment. The municipality used also this kind of uses, this temporary um, uses of the places, this participative and safe, self-made urbanism to um, make uses of empty uh, shops, for example, or to climb and try to develop a little bit more um, the city. And it was, there were practices that understand themselves kind of the opposite of these very classical, very strong and ways of urban design I showed before. And I will explain a little bit more about this um, with the uh, example of um, the airport of Tempelhof, which has been closed in the year 2008. I don't know if you can see the numbers. Um, and which, um, at the beginning, the municipality began, the municipality began to think about, okay, what to do with this huge place um, in the center of the city, how to develop it. It, it was clear that they wanted to um, build um, some houses and a very big open space. And during these first discussions, the airport um, is still being closed. And one day in 2009, people go into the airport and escorted the airport, say, open this place in the 
during the process, we, we want to use already this place now. And it was a first change on the meaning, okay, we have to integrate this kind of um, bottom-up experience, this kind of temporary uses we have learned all of the time. We have no investment and no kind of pressure, speculative pressure, for the new developments. So it was kind of new um, discussion of how can, what can be um, urban planning today. And there were mm, many interesting um, architectural offices and uh, artists working in this kind of strategies, looking and making, um, they were asked from the municip municipality to organize this process, to look what are the stakeholders, what, which um, um, actors and on the neighborhoods, ca how can we ask and, and ask the people to propose actions in the field, defining places with where well called um, um, pioneer places. And as you see from the kind of drawings and so on, they understand themselves in a way of participatory planning on open end planning, which you don't know how it will be see at the end and kind of the opposite of this myth of the European city. And with a lot of unspectacular, with a lot of surprises, with a lot of changes in between, and so on. So the city was agreeing with this kind of planning and with, was um, making a call for presenting uses. And uh, there were about 200 groups presenting what do you, they want to do in this kind of pioneer fields in Tempelhofafeld and they said it will be the first time this kind of process is integrated in the usual way of planning. They were imagining so people doing circus and sport and, and, the, and all Turkish mothers also doing gathering with the young creatives and so on. And, um, and I asked myself, and, 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 and in a way it was kind of opening the discourse, opening the place for other ways of doing planning. The discussions were very academic. If you see this kind of pictures who are talking there, they're the people of the, the architects and the people from the university and so on. So it was contesting this kind of myth of the European city, but it was contesting maybe uh, in a very superficial way. And parallel to this, the master planning of Tempelhof still continued. So this was the project, a very speculative high kind of housing in the fringes of the site. So um, mm, the neighbors, became aware that this process was a kind of legitimacy for the developing of a speculative place. Because after 2008, with the uh, financial crisis, financial investors were going to Berlin, and until now, the process of gentrification, as we heard in the uh, room next to us, are very high. Um, so they um, forced a popular vote about the uses of Tempelhof, and 2014, people vote mostly against the, um, any kind of building in the site. The politicians was, were saying all the time, no, this kind is a kind of naimbi, or people that are trying um, to uh, keep their privileges because they have a huge open space in front of the windows. But if you see the numbers, more than 700,000 people and um, rejecting the building of Tempelhof, it was a critique of the kind of development, of kind of neoliberal and um, speculative way of development. So after this decision, there is not building in Tempelhof, the pioneer fields are developing as they should, and so there is the nice side of the history. So I think new participation, participatory practice, where 
very good in the way they put in question former, very traditional, and um, Western and monocultural myths of doing urban planning. Nevertheless, in a process of municipalization, I think the, the main danger is to become co-opt by the neoliberalist uh, ways of production and so on. Artists are being co-opt as creative classes, public spaces are being co-opt as a consume places. So always this kind of participatory practice have to be um, always a um, very good observer from the citizenship. The citizenship is the system that has to uh, make these places everyday political places. Thank you very much. So, yeah. I, yeah. Sorry, um, I prepared the presentation, but with this voice, it's just impossible. But I wanted just to raise before, before we open for discussions to raise some questions uh, that come out of this discussion of public space. First of all, we have to understand that the very concept of public space, which we are in bed now, has its roots in the liberal thinking on city and materiality the liberal colonial thinking on the way space and material space should be organized because public and the birth of the notion of public has a lot to do with the birth of the notion of private. Private property and public property. Those concepts were born together in a very indissociate way and in a way that, of course, reinforces the idea of private property as the main cellule, as the main entry point to organize space. And public space becomes the rest, I mean, the way or the way to connect different private spaces but also public space became, and I see that in a movement especially uh, that came out of the 18th century and urban planning had a very important role on doing that to define public space as the private property of governments or the private property of the state which in the social division of power and the social division of work in the society should be, and this is a late 19th century notion that had added to that, used and mobilized in order to give some support to the reproduction of the workforce. But why I am saying that? Because of two things that were very clear for me during the presentations that we had today here. One thing is that the following step after, um, after the dismantling of the idea of state as the locus for protecting reproduction of the workforce. We don't have workforce anymore. We don't have work anymore. We don't have the state as um, a entity that uh, takes um, the well, part of the wealth which is produced by society in order to redistribute it uh, and to provide 
the reproduction of the workers, especially on those aspects that are not covered by the salaries and the incomes, like education, health, housing, and the things that used to be part of state um, responsibilities um, in the division of labor between private and state. So this does no longer exist. With the new liberal state under the hegemony of financial capital, um, the question of production and reproduction is irrelevant. And the question, the main question now, is how to manage and extract rent, profit, income from the process of occupying space. So it's not by chance that public space, the private property of government, was then privatized to um, private owners. And especially, this is a very long story, but let's make it short, to the real estate financial complex. Who runs our cities, period? The real estate financial complex took over the logic of organizing space, including public space. So if we are still thinking on the 19th century and early 20th century's idea of public space as being an spur for reproduction and redistribution, what happened today, late 20th century and early 2000s today is that public space became part of this machinery of the real estate financial complex of private transnational investors that are constantly looking for new frontiers and new fields, how and where to invest some products that are capable to uh, generate more interest, more income, more rent, a typically rentist capital with no connection whatsoever with the actual territories where this capital is, no connection. So it's not bizarre with the scenes that we have seen in Belgrade. This could be anywhere with the same investors, with the same design. And the tricky and the trap about that is that this is wrapped as being a new public space, fancy public space to be offered for the citizens to enjoy. And yes, Barcelona model of an urban planning based on urban, on this new public space, became clearly, and this is the trap, a model for rearranging and restructuring cities and clearly helping to generate symbols and images. It's not by chance that the mayor of Belgrade was hanging these posters in the entry of the city, generating symbols, new symbols of public space, but they are, in true, the actual vehicles in order for this uh, financial capital and real estate financial complex to take over the territory and get rid of the people. So I think that this is what's going on, and it's everywhere. It's global. So our discussion, how can our discussions on public space now uh, be in this struggles in the end in this conflict. On this regard, I think that uh, the struggles of Zagreb and the struggles of Berlin, even if Zagreb did not succeed, Berlin succeed, they are exactly the same. They are exactly the same struggle. They are a struggle between the idea of the territory being a common property of the dwellers, the citizens, 
versus the idea of a territory being a playground for international financial capital to play it. So in this fight, in this struggle, I think that all the squatting, all the conflictful planning, all the self-made planning, all the non-designed -pub non public spaces are today very important and very meaningful outposts that are not only resisting or trying to resist and confronting, but also prototyping other ways of thinking our cities in which, just to close it, we will get rid not only of, an, of the real estate financial complex, but also for this greed, very rigid greed of public-private urbanism, which in my view has, has to be destroyed as a basic concept and reconceptualized in practice. That's, that's my... <laughs>
uh, on it. So I wanted to maybe also, uh, again, I'll start with Shani and, and give her the opportunity also to explain what they did around their conflict, which was very complex. But I just want to put some things on the table and then we can open to the floor, as I said. One is uh, the capacity of the production of imaginary. I mean, the, the capacity to uh, produce a change in what is uh, tolerable or not. I mean, th that limit, I think, with the public space is, is a way. The opening, as I explained before, of the political conflict. Uh, then also the capacity to create new kinds of institutions. It doesn't have to be a city hall, I mean, a city council. We, can we uh, organize around, I don't know, uh, you know, like all, all other kinds of of uh, institution and also the capacity to address the changes in the material conditions of, of life, which I think is also one of the, of the main goals of our uh, political practices as well, not only to create imaginary, not only to create a new common sense, not only to put the political conflict, but also to produce here and now a better life for us uh, in, a, in a concrete uh, way. So, Jenny, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sorry I did not have a chance to put uh, like the, to present what we actually did, but where, where we stopped with the demolition. Uh, yeah, that was like a turning point for the people, for example, because also in the previous workshop we discussed how to involve people uh, into like dealing with these problems. Uh, yeah, I did not show it. So before the demolition, we would still react to every uh, step from the, them with protest, but we gathered like 2,000 people at most. After the demolition, we had 20,000 people on the streets. And that was the point where uh, people actually felt scared by the thing that police can refuse to come to help you if there is some higher interest involved. And that was scary for most of the people. For us, it, it, that moment was not something new, but for people, it was something that they felt personally involved. Uh, so it is also kind of disappointing that all those people came without really sharing your opinion about the urban project, but actually it opened up a space for us to, to give them arguments and to explain why is it bad. Uh, also for me personally, if you look like in 2014, I became involved in this uh, initiative as an architect helping people to put down the uh, amendments against the urban changes of general urban plan and three years later I'm here discussing what we did with all the this baggage that was put upon us I mean I did not show you but now we are like treated as enemies of the state they are tapping our phones they we receive, receive threats uh, we are, uh, there are newspapers saying that we were funded by CIA, uh, Rockefeller, and like every day something new. So those are really tough things to like be put against. But then actually it's kind of interesting that you realize that you can do it. Like, because, and it's totally spontaneous. You went there to protect something that you did not even no, you have, because we were never, I mean, we use the riverbank, but we don't use the whole area of the Belgrade waterfront. But when you see the level of ignorance on their side, you're like, okay, let's do it. And step by step, you also kind of stretch your boundaries and you realize that you are braver than you thought. And it's not that bad because you feel the power of all the people on the streets together and then it doesn't matter if you were threatened, some people were threatening to beat you up on the street, like because there are other people that don't think that you should be beaten up. So, I mean, uh, I don't know what was the question, but I, uh, I mean, people, I'm, I guess that the, the, also about the winning things. So we did not stop the project and we are not going to stop it, but we somehow raised the, the yeah, I mean, next time they think about doing the same thing, they know that they, it's not going to go that easy. So, I mean, it's small step, but also kind of encouraging. And also, I mean, uh, to also wake up all these people after 20 years of feeling depressed about uh, 
like common actions in public space, it's a huge thing. And for example, right now, I'm uh, in contact with six different small groups of people that are fighting against uh, urban plans in their small neighborhoods. So there are people gathering about around uh, change, like, I know, new residential buildings being uh, proposed or selling of the public land on like 300 square meters uh, plots. And there are like groups of people, neighbors that are calling us to help them with that. And uh, here we are fighting like 100 acres. Like who cares? This is what's important because now f people feel uh, liberated and capable of dealing with stuff. And that is like the point where we also erase all the political differences because when people like feel that there is something that they are threatened by, then it's you find some like common language and like that's the thing that's important because they are always trying to put us on this high political level like you are against the prime minister and I say okay I don't have anything against them personally because if all the system is not changed and if the guy goes away and the system is like, like the same we don't, did not do anything so I don't care about them I care about the process how we manage to get to this point where the citizen can be ignored in such high level so yeah <laughs> and I would like to ask uh, Frances about also like giving a measure from the government of what is possible to do, no? Because we know that the neighbor council actually uh, manages the city also to a certain degree, and I am uh, still a uh, uh, fearful defender of the administrative level because I think that the, this happens so because the state allows them to do so. So what are also the tools, no? Because I think that there is also interesting uh, the other day, David was, was uh, also mentioning how the Superilla is also a way that promoters are trying to buy especially properties in the places where the Superilla are going to be developed and, and how the city council can but one thing that we, control the, that. One thing that we have seen, uh, the, the super blocks is not the problem. The problem is the financial market that arrives to Barcelona, but Barcelona is on fashion but not bought by super blocks. It's why, because uh, there are good prices and a good renting. This is uh, the question. And for us, the only solution is to stop all the promotions. All the, when a invest, uh, an, uh, an investment company arrives here to, to introduce uh, apartments for rich people, we try to stop the because they have to make different reforms and we have to, to, to give the, 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 the license, we, we stop the license and we hope with this we are going to, to, to try to find another, another business in another place. This is the idea we, we tried at this moment, but we have to, to change the legislation in Spain and also in Catalonia government, autonomous government, but at the moment this is the, the, the instrument that we have at this moment. The idea that, that we are going to, to try in the next uh, years is more or less this. Uh, the, there are no business, there are no renting in Barcelona. Get out to, to a other place. Huh? But uh, it's the only thing that we can do at this moment. It, and to Laura is I am um, I, I do like two more questions and then I open the floor I, I saw you and I I think it's interesting that uh, you both mentioned this idea of the Trojan horse no like I I am uh, like what is the change also in Berlin where it's not anymore like at <coughs> the end of the 90s beginning of the 2000s where the space was empty, empty and, and available. 
not in, in Tempelhof, but what has happened with the rest of the voids, the small voids in the city, no, where, where the pioneers, I mean, I know Klaus uh, Obermeier from, uh, no, they did this uh, research that was back in the 2000s. And, but what, what happens when the capital actually starts, when the, a lot of investors, a lot of them from Spain, are investing also in housing, and how is, if, if apart from the Tempelhof, this also happens like in Belgrade, that to take like one big example also maybe helps to infiltrate in, in, the, in the smaller uh, experiences, and how is the city dealing with it? How do they pro protect? Because I think it was also related with the commons. The commons were never about property. Actually, the, the, the forest, the, no, the, the law, the char la Carta de la Foresta in Britain related to the forests that were owned by the king. So the commons is not a question of ownership, it's, que it's a question of management and use and, and rights uh, not to, to, the, to the resources. So if you can yeah. shortly elaborate a little bit of this. And yeah, so the, the, the most of the voids are disappearing and Berlin is being constructed now and like in the beginning of the 90s, it's a really high speculative moment um, now in um, housing. Housing prices are increasing incredible. And um, I think a couple of months ago in a, a survey, uh, most of 50% of the people said they are afraid to lose the rental apartment. Most of 50% of the population are afraid of that. And because it's mostly a rental uh, city and if the prices increase, they don't know if they can afford it anymore. So the main discourse is we have to build, we have to build a lot. And of course, the kind of buildings that are, in which investors are investing are also not affordable. So now the um, kind of policies is to look, okay, what could be or what are the policies to create um, public affordable housing or to um, buy uh, houses, existing houses, to um, reduce the, um, the housing prices after years of privatization. They have privatized many, many um, um, housing sites. But connected to public space, it's, I think, always one of the um, main difficulties of planning, how to improve public space in the ways which is maybe uh, negotiated with the actors, hopefully, uh, hopefully, and it lived there, how to improve public space without to create gentrification and um, re-evaluation of the land. Yeah, and I think I, I understand um, also your um, claim for um, that um, financialization is financializing also the public. And in, in this way that the image of the quarters of the neighborhoods at all are increasing in that way that the land is attractive. And there were examples in Berlin where um, people were um, putting on the balconies shops from very bad kind of markets to show we are a bad neighborhood, please don't come here. Yeah? But of course this is not kind of working and we can also not say we, will, we don't want to improve the public space and the neighborhoods who can also not see that. So I think mm -hmm. the kind of um, strategies have to be like in Tempelhof to say, okay, this land is not for uh, privatizing. This land is not for building or yes, for building, but for public housing or these rents, we have to appropriate these rents so that financial actual, uh, actors are not more interested in this. I forgot one thing that for me is very important in Barcelona now, there is a union of tenants, a new syndicate. I think it's very, very important. Now at the, at the council, we try to connect them with the housing office and to create a, a very real collaboration because with them we are going to stop the, the new investors that arrives. It, it is the question and we are going to try to, to stop them because we have a, a, a very good information. Yeah, last question, do you have? I was making a round, and I didn't 
continue. So I'm happy to open the questions, but all the speakers got the questions and Eva didn't. No, we didn't. No, I'm fine. But she's fine. So after the campaign, a lot of the people, I'm telling you uh, the, the comments what, and the critics, the critics of the people. The people were saying that uh, they accused us of being uh, an intellectual elite. They said that because our program was really based on uh, waste management, electricity, like a lot of the, the needs, and there are so many needs that are not being met by the politicians or the government or the, the state. So uh, when and we went and we talked about public space as well as a need and necessity. And for them, that for the people and everyone, that was a sign of elitism. Like this was a sign of uh, not attached to the reality. And my question is, how do you make people understand that public space is actually a need uh, and a priority in a city more than it being a luxury type of? Uh, because really, we have to go back and discourse from the beginning, you know, it's not a fact that the public space is actually uh, in any of the city. So that was one of my uh, main questions. And how to keep people interested, actually, because I think in Beirut the only uh, successful thing that we can do is really participate planning and really uh, mobilizing the street because, for example, there was one, one of the last remaining sand beaches construction of the hotel started at the end of it and then uh, we mobilized as um, civil campaigns and we uh, went into uh, court, we won three uh, law 
lawsuits against them, and then it only went to the superior court, and then they uh, they went and they later like uh, reversed the, another conclusion to the hotel. So like after two pages of, of six months, they basically uh, and lawsuits it, it, it got stopped again. So I, in my opinion, video disputes are really one of the solutions to actually uh, stop these things. So how do you keep people interested? In Understanding that public space is a need or a necessity for them, uh, electricity or uh, unemployment or blah 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 is are really much more important right now.
right to occupy the public space, the right to live on the public space, uh, the right to produce the public space, and maybe the right to thinking other than human on public space, like nature and maybe animals. Okay, just last one, and then everyone. Uh, so But neither to create a new network because there are already uh, enough networks. I think that what, what we could try to identify here is what are those lines of conflict or, or those tools used that could combine you know, different places on concrete actions. That, that's why also we, we brought in the, the, these, these things. So thinking how, for example, you no, know, like one knowledge can be used, but also what kind of of uh, common 
Uh, whatever, you know? We, we, I, I don't know very clear what we can do in public space, I have to admit. So what we have on the table is the question of Beirut that I think resonates with uh, Sweden, which is basically what do you do I mean, the question a bit is, what do you do when there is not the sense that there is a conflict about the public space because for whatever reason, you don't think that is a conflict, either it's privatized and it's good or it's a luxury and there are many other things that come before. Uh, this idea of what happens with the, with the uh, social justice and, and the class issue and the, I guess the uh, strong inequality no, in, uh, in the territories. Uh, the fourth, the th third one would be what other ways to privatize public space that is not only to put uh, terraces or to actually privatize the space, but also to privatize a lot of things that happen in the space, like the data and the activities and so on. Um, then uh, privatization of cultural heritage and I don't know if the water is really a question, maybe not. Okay. Uh, so also how public space has, you know, like a symbolic capital and symbolic value in, in many places that are, is also uh, privatized. So I don't know if you want to take each of you one or not, or two of them. Maybe you don't have to answer to all of them, but Eve is going to start. Thank you. Well, I don't know uh, if I, I'm for sure I'm not going to address everything. I just uh, I uh, think that also what we were talking about here is how you improve a life or part of the city without gentrifying it. What would be the tools? And also, there, I, I'm referring to your question, but also how do you organize uh, around this solidary distribution inside of the city somehow? How do you create this situation uh, of, of the, I, I think those are the, I, I just, one thing was on my mind. We were fighting this development of the um, mayor wanting to invest two million euros in this park, which nobody wanted. And the, the main fight was, you know, he can't do this, it's horrible, we don't want it. But the other uh, part was, but again, he's giving our neighborhood two million euros. Uh, what are we going to do? Uh, how, and the issue then, what we worked a lot on with uh, initiatives in the, uh, there and people around it, is um, talking about how this money can be better used and with more solidarity. It was the first question that we, we worked with them on actions, and then once the people realize, once the people, once, you know, <laughs> Once this happens, once uh, everybody feels this force, this injustice, whatever their uh, issue is, then you start talking about, okay, but how do we build the schools in the neighborhood where there are no schools? How do we clean up the streets uh, in the neighborhood that, that, that are, are completely filthy and things like that? So I think through, in my experience, through action and through really working with different communities, we were, to some extent, I've seen this, this is the only solution that I can, solution. This is the only tactic uh, that I think happens in real time where once you feel the force that is, uh, and this goes to the other questions uh, about how do you create, what does public space mean uh, in, in, in this creation of conflict. Once that you are faced, as Xenia said, uh, with this force and inability to do anything, and, and once you feel it, then the creation of action and the creation of communities comes about. Sometimes it's public space, sometimes it's something different. Here we were talking about public space, that's why this, is, this, this was the issue. But I think this experience is the, is, the, is the main thing. And I don't think, also goes to the Lebanon question, I don't think that, uh, that we are here to convince anybody of anything. I think uh, as Anna also said, that the opportunities come about in our own realities. When this force is shown in the public space, or this force, as in case in, in Barcelona, was shown in the case mostly housing, and then you organize around it, and this becomes a political issue, then it's an issue. I believe, I believe that the uh, question of, of lack of public housing is a bigger social issue than the one public street but I cannot make it happen just because I think so. 
one public street made people aware of the force that was uh, that was um, there. Yeah. yeah. So that's yeah, yeah. kind of comment on that. I, I thought maybe Raquel wanted to say something about this social justice. Yeah, I think there are two. There are more, but at least two big lies about neoliberal urban policies. Huge lies. First, first lie. Uh, the state is going out because it's inefficient and out of resources, and then uh, private, private entrepreneurs and private entities are coming in. The market is coming in. Completely lie. The state, as Anna said, is, if we talk about the real estate financial complex, or if we, if we talk about the new ways of, of privatizing um, urban and public space, which is management, like smart city, it's not towers, it's a different, it's a new frontier. If you take that, the state is absolutely central creating conditions, making possible, creating regulations, and leading. So the real estate financial complex is a triangle. And the finance is there, the construction and, and the real estate is there, and the state is there. The state at all levels, national, local, including. So this is the first thing. The second thing, which is the basis that all, for all of that is that all oh, the state had bankrupt. It's the debt, the public debt is very large. We, the state doesn't have more money. Government don't have more money. So let's do public-private partnerships with the private because then they can come with the money to change things, including places where there is no money circulating super hyper lie <laughs> all those operations all of those that we have seen including smart city management operations are funded by public funds in a way or another can be through tax exemptions fiscal uh, promotions public funds public uh, public banks so we must make this very clear uh, because on top of all that, it's our money. They are doing that with our money, not private money, not private companies' money. So I think it, this is a very important argument. The argument that if we dismantle this argument politically, and I completely agree with you, depending on each city, how can we show that? Depending on each city, what are the conflicts today that can show? And tricky, sometimes this is not as visible. Just give you, you one tiny example of my city, Sao Paulo, recent example. We have a mayor which is a copy of Donald Trump. <laughs> so you can believe what it is. A co fake copy of Donald Trump. <laughs> and Doria. And he just launched a public-private par partnership of affordable housing, so-called public-private partnership of affordable housing. So he went on demolishing and destroying a very important historical neighborhood in the center of Sao Paulo uh, last week and destroyed the buildings with the people inside the building. Can you believe? Uh, in order to build affordable housing, daycare centers, public schools um, in those places. So the tricky thing is that, of course, the public-private partnership will never cater for those who are vulnerable and who need more, because the basic assumption is that it must uh, bring profit and in order to be profitable, cannot be something that is meant for those who does not have any money. So any, any operation of that is like 
uh, entering with a Trojan horse into the spaces, including when we are talking about affordable housing, public equipment, and things like that. Uh, for me, that the idea when we have entered to the to the municipality, one of things that you you can see, according, I am agree with with an, the idea that the welfare state. It was an idea that somebody uh, think about you, huh? but this is not is not enough. You you need a self management of the community. That if you are organized, you put the administration to the service of, to the people. This is important because the management of the 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 municipality sometimes is not organized for the people. It's organized for the, for, for the, for the companies who, who make an investments. Because in our, in our district, for example, it was a service for investments, for the people who, who arrive here to, to get information. And the district give all the information. And, and we are not prepared for this. And, at this moment, we try to, I, I think the, the, the movement of this organization uh, is to try to, to, to rebuild the state by the roots of the cities. It is because you, you can organize a new system from the cities with, uh, with uh, help of, of the people organized. Self-management is, is very important. For me, it's very important the example of the syndicate of, uh, of tenants that we are cooperating with the municipality and we create an urban system and we talk about public space. Public space has only design, no? It's not that the question. The question is how we reorganize the urban system. It, it, you, you need to, to ask all another time and to rebuild another another structure and if for this uh, you have to be creative but recuperate the, the state but we arrive to the state from the cities this is for me the the idea the movements that try to answer the problems for, from the people and try to to, to yeah to 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 try to to answer to, to look for the answers from the realities of the cities and after rebuild the new structure of the state. This is one of the ideas that I think is important for us now. Maybe something small. I, I was just thinking about the Sweden because we always think like, ah, they don't have any problems, but then you realize they do have problems. <laughs> And I was thinking how, like, if you ask people, because in Belgrade also it was always like, ah, it's nicer than it was. Like, now we have a reconstructed promenade, why are you against it? It's so beautiful. But yes, because it was really awful, but then when it was really awful, people still were using it. So it's not a question of beauty, uh, being beautiful or ugly. It's more important than that. So I was thinking, like, if people would uh, always say they like uh, restaurants, that's normal. I mean, restaurants are nice. But if they don't have any idea of what can be other than that, how can they know like, that it can be, like if you would ask them what do you want, it's different than choose from, from these three options. Maybe they would choose to have a bench where we, they can sit with their neighbors. Maybe if you ask them, do you know names of your neighbors, maybe they would realize they don't and they would think about they need a place where they can actually meet. So I mean, being trained as an architect, I also, also think that I know everything the best, but you don't know. So I guess it's also important, although it sounds scary, that you have to trust people to decide when they are asked like, from the bottom of their hearts what they, do, what they need, like that they would actually think about things and respond like, as human beings. 
but you also, I mean, even if we know that we are on the like, I don't know, right part of the history, you also, I mean, you can fail in explaining. So it's kind of training for both sides. And so you always have to reinvent uh, ways to like explain the bigger problems by something that is tangible for people there. So yeah, I mean, from in Belgrade, we actually just opened the fountain that was like two million euros worth. So it sings, so it has music and really it's spectacular, but like two million euros. So I mean, you, it's easy to say, okay, did you really want to spend two million euros on this? And people would say, oh, of course not. Maybe in Lebanon, if they, I mean, you always have to, maybe you should find something that people can feel and then through that explain bigger things. I mean, because the, the, the system, the state system is too complicated to now address like housing issues, blah, 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 but then in small things, it, they can recognize why is it important. So Just trust people. One minute and then we go to it. I wanted to thank you because I look forward to giving you a question. Because I think, and often when we talk about public space, we forget or we don't make explicit that we are talking about inequality, about dispossession. I think all the time, and all the examples we showed were about an inequality and about dispossession as the question of privatization of heritage. And I'm, I'm, I'm changing yet uh, now um, to Barcelona, and where the first movements um, from where, um, in the transition to democracy were from the most private uh, quarters, from the slums in the, uh, um, and, and the coast, in the waterfront. So I think um, if there is a perception that you can do it, that there is an alternative, there is possibility to fight, then there are people um, standing up. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And, uh